Our speaker today is Alan Kellum. Alan is a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Arlington, our neighbor. He is, actively na he is active nationally with Unitarian Universalists for Justice in the Middle East, known as UUJME. Locally with NOVA UUJME and statewide with the Virginia Coalition for Human Rights. Alan has Quaker roots and taught at the Ramallah Friends for School Friends Schools for, in Palestine in 1968 through 1970, represented Quakers on the National Council of Churches of Christ, NCC, Division of Overseas Ministries from 1970 to 1975, and worked as an NCC contractor, co-editing their journal. I don't know how you say that, Alan. Swayzia. Swayzia. Stands for from 1975 to 1979. In addition, he published the Mideast Observer in Washington from 1979 to 1985 and produced several voting record issues for the Washington Report in the late 1980s. After a subsequent 25 year career in IT and data management, he returned for working for justice and peace in Israel and Palestine as a volunteer Allen has worked with Churches for Middle East Peace as a regional coordinator in Virginia from 2018 to 2024, and we welcome Allen today. Our time, our time for All Ages is a story that I found called Yaffa and Fatima, Shalom Salam. This is a traditional tale that is said to have both Jewish and Arab roots. It was originally written about two brothers, of course, but this newer version is about two female neighbors, one Jewish and one Muslim. In a beautiful land called the land of milk and honey, there lived two neighbors. One was named Yaffa and the other was named Fatima. Yaffa and Fatima each owned a beautiful date grove. During the week, they both worked very hard gathering their dates. On most days, Yaffa and Fatima sold all their dates in the market and were able to buy plenty of tasty food to eat, which they often shared. Yaffa loved Fatima's shmarma and Fatima loved Yaffa's schnitzel. Yaffa prayed in the synagogue and Fatima prayed in the mosque. They both loved God and they both loved to follow God's way. Yaffa would read from her Siddur in the morning and Fatima would read from her Quran in the morning. Yaffa fasted on Yom Kippur, and Fatima fasted during Ramadan. Fatima celebrated Aid. Yaffa celebrated Passover. When Yaffa saw Fatima, she would wave and call, Shalom, peace. When Fatima saw Yaffa, she would wave and call, Salam, peace. One year, there was very little rain. Fatima and Yaffa had very few dates to eat or to sell at the market. Yaffa lay awake at night. She was worried. Maybe Fatima's hungry, thought Yaffa. Fatima lay awake at night. She was worried. Perhaps Yaffa didn't have enough to eat today, thought Fatima. Fatima placed a basket of dates on her donkey and then she took them to Yaffa's house. She poured the dates into a basket on Yaffa's porch. Meanwhile, Yaffa collected a basket of dates and placed it on her donkey and carried it to Fatima's house. She poured the dates into a basket on Fatima's porch. The two neighbors quietly made their way back home feeling happy. 
In the morning when Yaffa walked onto her porch, to her great surprise, she saw a basket full of dates. Goodness, I have so many dates. I will take more to Fatima tonight. Meanwhile, Fatima walked out onto her porch and was just as surprised. Goodness, I have more dates than I thought. I will take some to Yaffa tonight. Both that night, both Yaffa and Fatima loaded their donkeys with dates and set off toward each other's homes. They met where their fields came together. <laughs> Fatima looked at Yaffa. Yaffa looked at Fatima. The two friends hugged and laughed. Shalom, said Yaffa. Salam, said Fatima. Thank you for thinking of me, said Yaffa. Thank you for thinking of me, said Fatima. Together they returned to Yaffa's house to share a meal of dates and tea. All right. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. And now we have Alan speaking for us. Good morning. In mid-March, uh, I was here briefly uh, to encourage you to support UUJME you uh, use for justice in the Middle East with share the plate. And at that time I spoke words of, of hope and reconciliation in regard to the Israel-Palestine conflict and, and the horrible conflict that's going on in Gaza. I pointed not to what was wrong, but to uh, something that was very much right, very, very good. A village in Israel of about 400 people uh, where an equal number of Jewish and Palestinian Arab families uh, live as equals in an intentional community. And so um, I was asked back today to continue with a message of hope. The hope that uh, a community uh, like Nevi Shalom offers uh, also gives uh, ripples of change that go out from there and go, go forth to other places. Uh, one of the changes that it has affected is that it has given a model for a type of school that has both, both Hebrew and Arabic and where people learn and respect each other's culture. And uh, that has been set out in terms of uh, something called hand-in-hand hand hand schools and there are about six of them in, um, uh, in Israel, including in Jerusalem. Um, um, so I'll talk about uh, not only uh, places, but also uh, people and organizations uh, that reinforce the message that people can live together as equals perhaps even in, in our own local community. Uh, so I'll give a glimpse of uh, my home church also, and uh, which is the UU Church of Arlington, Virginia, and, and some of the things that we've done there as a UU JME chapter. Um, I hope that I can even inspire you perhaps to uh, start a chapter here of your own. So here goes. Uh, Navi Shalom, uh, Oasis of Peace, ha um, has the school that I've mentioned and, and then the hand-in-hand -hand, hand -hand schools that have come from it. Uh, those things are good news. On the other hand, uh, the vast majority of schools in Israel are segregated and uh, decidedly not, not equal. Uh, housing is segregated, and especially in settlements in the occupied territory where housing is for Jews only. Um, in fact, um, Israel is organized so that there's very little positive interaction uh, between the Israeli Jewish population and the non-Jewish population of Muslim and Christian Palestinian Arabs, despite the fact that the numbers of these two populations 
are roughly equal at about 7.3 million. Uh, that is, there are 7.3 million Palestinians, counting those in Israel proper, Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Gaza, and 7.3 Israeli Jews. Um, during COVID, though, uh, Israel established uh, quarantine hotels, and uh, they didn't fit this pattern of segregation that, okay, you're sick, you go here. Uh, so uh, during that time, uh, there was a young Jewish woman named uh, Noam Schuster, who was raised in Nevi Shalom and um, was, uh, um, was surprised at suddenly being in this, this mixed group, but then she was used to it. She was familiar with it. She was comfortable with it. And um, various news organizations, CNN, uh, PBS, and The New Yorker all picked up her story of briefly being there and how uh, she was able to um, uh, speak in Arabic and in Hebrew. Uh, she also uh, had been a, a peacemaker with the UN, but switched to, uh, believe it or not, uh, stand-up comedy. So uh, she uh, was able to interact and get people to interact and actually to uh, find themselves laughing with each other at what was happening. So this uh, story of suddenly this sort of utopian community coming of all places in a, a COVID quarantined hotel uh, uh, hit a lot of the news outlets. So um, I've got a, a brief uh, clip. This one uh, happens to be, uh, well, there were lots of clips to ch choose from, but there's a New Yorker documentary about her. Um, and this particular clip I took from um, an Arab American comedy show, uh, 1001 Laughs, and you'll see how um, these um, Palestinian Arabs react to this Jewish woman coming into their midst. So. First Jewish comedian ever come to the stage here at the 1001 Laughs Comedy Festival. So please help me welcome to, I gave her Arabic name, please help me welcome to the stage, Naime Schuster. <laughs> It's your lucky night, the Mossad is here to record you! <laughs> Just kidding. My name is Noam. White liberals can't pronounce my name, so they call me Chomsky. <laughs> my last name is Schuster, so I have a name of a Jewish European professor from MIT in a body of a Persian Wonder Woman. <laughs> my parents are considered traitors. They're left-wing liberals. So they raised me in a mixed community where Jews and Palestinians live together. My best friend Ranin, she's a Palestinian, she looks like Gigi Hadid, I look like Ahmadinejad next to her. <laughs> when we cross checkpoints, the soldiers, they stop our car, they hit on her, and they look at me and they're like, give me your ID, please. Uh, shifting now uh, to another location, this time on the West Bank. There's uh, a family farm um, of the Na Nasser family uh, near Bethlehem. Um, their farming continues, but they have also started an educational organization called Ten of Nations on their farm. Uh, many of us, as we travel over there, uh, uh, visit them. Um, and rather than me telling the story, let's hear from uh, David Daoud and let him tell the story that he told to the Carter Center a few years ago. We are now being isolated, becoming isolated. The farm is located in the center of five Israeli settlements. No electricity, no water, and no building permits. And this is, of course, the story of many, many other Palestinians who are in the same situation. According to Dawood Nassar, too many young Palestinians, faced with difficult and demoralizing situations, resort to violence, accept despair, or move away. 
Dawood and his wife Jihan Nassar believe in another option, a fourth way. We are people who believe in human rights and we believe in justice. And we, we believe that one day the sun of justice will rise again. So this brought us to the concept of the fourth way, which is a non-violent way of resistance. And our slogan is, we refuse to be hands. And this is what I call it today, the fourth way of a non-violent resistance. The land was bought by my grandfather in 1916, and he registered the land. It was under the Ottoman rule at that time. So we got papers from the Ottomans, and then my father and uncle kept re-registering the land during the British, the Jordanians, and even we have documents after 1967 from the Israelis. So the land is fully registered from 1916 until today. So we face, and we are still facing difficulties, legal difficulties, but we are still there. Confronted with this intense opposition, the Nassars found a way to apply their Christian faith and their concept of the fourth way of nonviolent resistance to bring hope to young people. They created Tent of Nations, a family farm that develops skills and creates a connection to the land. And with the Tent of Nations, we want to invest the frustration that we have in a positive way. Because when people get frustrated, they become angry and they react negative. For us, we said that like, we want to convert the negative energy that we might have in a positive way. No electricity, we install the solar power system. No rainwater, we depend on rainwater. No building on the ground, we started building under the ground, generating existing caves. And we became like an educational environmental farm. The Nasser family and Tent of Nations, uh, uh, if you read the New York Times, you may have uh, read about them last week um, in an article by uh, Nicholas Kristof. Uh, the title of his article was Meet the Followers of Martin Luther King Jr. in the West Bank. Crystal also wrote about uh, Isa Amro, uh, who is a nonviolent Palestinian activist in Hebron. Uh, who has a knack for insisting on his human rights and in the process is all too often uh, beaten up by soldiers or, or settlers. Christoph uh, uh, said last week in the New York Times, some Palestinians see people like the Nasser's and Amro as ineffect ineffectual or irre irrelevant, but in a region that seems so bleak, so caught up in cycles of escalating conflict, where extremists on one side empower extremists on the other, I think of the peacemakers as voices of our better angels. I write about them in hopes that we can collectively amplify their voices. Um, as an aside, I'd like to give a little plug for Christoph's new book, uh, Chasing Hope, as he tackles much the same thing that, theme that I'm attempting today, but with a broader perspective than just Israel-Palestine. Christoph observed that side by side with the worst atrocities, you also found people who act humanely and heroically like the Nasser's and Isa Amro. In a minute, I'll tell about some of the things that we've done uh, locally as, as a congregation to work towards uh, amplifying the vo voices, but uh, First, I'd like to tell you about a couple of other organizations in, in Israel and Palestine that are working together for positive change. One is an organization of Israeli Jews and Palestinians who have lost immediate family members in the conflict and now speak as one voice to say, enough, stop the violence. Um, the, the organization, um, one, the first organization that I'm referring to is Parent Circle Family Forum, um, and that um, meets regularly. Uh, they, they also try to seek uh, reconciliation with uh, whoever may have committed the uh, act of killing a relative. Um, um, I've heard two, uh, well, w and they send out pairs of speakers, one uh, Israeli Jewish and one uh, Palestinian, uh, each having lost uh, family members. 
And I've had uh, the privilege of hearing one, in, one pair of speakers in Jerusalem and another pair in a, in a local church, uh, Rock Springs Church, very, Rock Spring Church, very close to where we are, a UCC church. Um, and there, um, the pair consisted of a woman who was originally from South Africa and whose 20-year-old uh, son, and this is an Israeli Jewish woman for, originally from South Africa with a 20-year-old son who was killed by a Palestinian at a military checkpoint that the young Israeli soldier was manning. The other member of the pair was a former Palestinian fighter whose 10-year-old uh, daughter was killed by an Israeli soldier in front of her school. Uh, each told of their own loss and the support that they received from the other bereaved parents, as well as their effort to reach out to the humanity of the others and to work for an end to the violence. Um, they are a group that wants no, no, no more new members. Um, in other words, no more deaths in the conflict. And other organizations whose membership um, overlaps with the parent circle is combatants for peace. In fact, the uh, Palestinian fighter that I had just referred to, uh, he was one of the uh, early founders of uh, or early members of that organization, which was actually started when uh, some Israeli soldiers who were refusing to, to take active duty in the occupied territories, uh, particularly the West Bank, uh, reached out to um, Palestinians. And of course, there was a time when they, probably a year or so, when they really didn't quite trust each other. It, had to, it took a long time to build trust. But now that uh, organization, Combatants for Peace, has become a very uh, active organization. Um, Uh, let me mention a couple of other worthy organizations which uh, even in, in their names emphasize Israelis and Palestinians living together in the land. One is called, one is called Standing Together and um, uh, the New Israel Fund, uh, which uh, funds a lot of um, civil rights and human rights organizations that are um, both Israeli and Palestinian organizations that are working in that area. It, it uh, was the original founder of Standing Together. And the other one's named um, A Land for All. So there are uh, organizations that despite what all is happening are, are working on these issues. Now, let me say uh, now turning to our local church and, and some of the things we've done at uh, UU Church of Arlington um, at uh, UUCA, um, our work began in 2014 as uh, Jean Mulligan, who recently died at, I think, about 95, returned from a UUJME-sponsored trip to Israel-Palestine and brought back his realization that one group of people ruling another for more than a half century of occupation is damaging to both peoples. He talked about his experience and he showed films uh, such as Five Broken Cameras. Five Broken Cameras was an Oscar nomination, um, nominated 2013 documentary film from the village of Baleen on the West Bank, which held a weekly protest uh, of the sizable amount of land that a nearby settlement seized from them. Their struggles were filmed by one of the local villagers whose camera kept getting broken in the process, so hence the name Five Broken Cam Cameras. And um, an Israeli filmmaker then edited his raw footage, and, and as I said, uh, his film was among the 2013 Oscar nominations for Best Documentary. Uh, another film is The Gatekeepers, which is a documentary film um, of interviews uh, with six former heads of the Shin Bet, uh, the Israeli uh, essentially internal um, police, discussing their successes and failures in controlling the Palestinian population since the Six-Day War. Um, 
at at the um, UUC, at UUCA, uh, um, we've had other activities, including uh, showing showing and discussing films. Initially, our interest group met weekly to discuss and plan events, and eventually we became a UU Jamie chapter and ended up meeting monthly. And um, uh, one of our members, who's uh, a person of color, moderated a UU Jamie panel that you might have attended if you went to GA in Kansas City, and that was entitled White Supremacy from Ferguson to Standing Rock to Palestine. She also did a photography um, and exhibit that uh, we displayed at our church, but I think part of it was also displayed at GA. Um, we have also, our, our chapter has partnered with Churches for Middle East Peace, an organization that has um, more than 30 religious organizations. Uh, and significantly, um, UUA, our own denominations association, was a founding member of uh, CMEP uh, nearly 40 years ago and, is, is continu and continues to be on the board. Uh, additionally, at our church, we uh, take part uh, along with 28 churches in our, in our area with something called the olive oil ministry, which sells uh, olive oil uh, to help raise funds for activities such as uh, the Tent of Nations and uh, they also uh, gave some money for some of the um, um, hospitals that in, in Gaza. Um, so in, in 2023, um, they sold uh, 2,500 bottles of olive oil. And our, our church, we have a, a member that uh, on her own sold over 100 of those. Um, the income was something like 23,000 uh, altogether. And, uh, and then other people uh, without paying for the olive oil have given donations. So there's another, another 42,000 in donations. So um, we, we played a small part in, in that olive oil ministry at our church. Uh, locally, we have worked with Voices from the Holy Land uh, film series. Um, since its inception nine years ago, it started at the Grace Presbyterian Church in Springfield. We then were the second church to host it and to show films and then have a discussion. And um, altogether uh, in our area, there were film showings uh, uh, sponsored by 50, 50 some religious organizations, including Jewish and Muslim groups. Uh, but during COVID, it became purely Zoom. So, um, uh, but it followed the same format of people uh, viewing the films and they viewed them on their own. Uh, I guess that was a difference before we viewed them together and then talked. But in, uh, with COVID, uh, the week or two before, they were able to view the they're able to view the films free, and then uh, and then view the the Zoom discussion. And uh, to give people a sense of really participating at the end of the Zoom uh, panel discussion, which may have hundreds of people on it, we break into um, breakout groups and give people a chance to talk in groups of four, five, eight, whatever, very small uh, groups so people can uh, raise their own voice, which is not often the case when you're just watching a Zoom. So, um, uh, since we uh, believe and work towards goals of two peoples way over there getting together, uh, it's important for us also to live that within our own community. Um, and um, the best manifest manifestation of that, uh, the biggest success that we had was to have a, a musical gathering and uh, we teamed up with um, a person that regularly schedules, uh, called Focus Music, I think it's called, regularly schedules entertainers. And we had a Muslim, a UU, 
and a, a Jewish entertainer, um, each participating. And we had uh, 300 people each paying $10 uh, uh, at this gathering. Uh, Shalom, Salam, peace was the name of, of the gathering. And uh, we actually had quite a bit of money left over, which we gave to the um, Jewish Islamic Dialogue Society in, in the DC area. So, um, um, I should mention that uh, our church at that time uh, had both a Jewish con Reconstructionist community and a Muslim uh, group which used our space for Friday worship. And um, one of the interesting things was that uh, as there were things happening outside the walls of the church that uh, made us feel less than safe, the synagogue sought additional security and they hired a member of the Muslim uh, congregation as, as their security guard. So. Um, but the, um, even though that gathering of 300 people was, was great, uh, the actual apex of, of the work occurred in 2019 as our congregation, uh, led by our interim minister, Reverend Teresa Cooley, took a trip to Israel-Palestine using uh, Mejdi Travel. Uh, Mejdi is a travel company uh, founded by uh, a Palestinian and an American Jewish man. And uh, in their uh, travel, um, um, Geraldine Brooks has written about it in the Smithsonian Magazine, uh, in, the, in the travel, they have guides that are from both groups and, and provide the, a dual perspective uh, during, the, during the trip. Um, so um, our trip had uh, 23 people um, who, from the congregation led by uh, Reverend Cooley. And I was amazed that when she returned she almost immediately had a sermon, and um, let's uh, let's see part of that sermon. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it would uh, take a little too much time to show it all. So. What I would like to do is simply give you some glimpses of what we experienced and what we witnessed. And as I begin to do so, I can hear the echo in my head of the demand of one of the activists who spoke with us, Basim Tamimi, who said over and over again, do not come here to feel sorry for us. We do not need your pity. We don't even need your support. We do not need you to save us. We need you to understand the nature of injustice. We need you to see that we are all a part of the same system which keeps all of us from being free. Basem Tamimi lives in a tiny village called Nabi Sala in the West Bank outside of Ramallah, Ramallah, where his family has resided for over 400 years. He says proudly that some of his ancestors are Jewish. Everyone in his small village shares the same name because they are all related in some way. Their town grew up around a small precious spring because sources of water in the desert are the primary source of life. But decades ago, the occupation came and took over the spring and diverted it for the use of a settlement that was built on the next hill over from the town. This settlement has already taken over 40% of the Tamimi's land and continues to try to force more and more of them off. As we visited in Basem's house, 
There was a bulldozer strategically placed just yards from his front door to make a point. In 2009, Bassem organized a simple protest. He and his family and any who wished to join them would simply march down to the spring. The spring which had been the source of life for their family for centuries, and they didn't do it to provoke a fight. They simply wanted to show that they had the right to be there, to simply be present. They were met with armed settlers and then Israeli soldiers who lobbed stones, tear gas, shot rubber bullets, and sometimes live rounds into a small group of men and women and children. 25 of the villagers were injured, but they were not deterred. Every Friday, they continued to come. Every Friday since, they continue to come, sometimes joined by international observers or advocates, often including Jewish activists. They continue to march every Friday to try to reach their spring, and they're never allowed to reach that far. Bassem has been held in jail over 12 times. He says he's lost track of how many times. For a total of four years of his adult life, almost none of those times was he formally charged with a crime, let alone convicted. He was once beaten so badly that his brain came loose in his skull and he was in a coma for 10 days. When he came out of his coma, he learned that his sister had been killed by a mob of settlers because she was standing in front of the jail that had taken her 14-year-old son. And she was asking for his release. And she was beaten to death. His wife, Nariman, is every bit the activist that he is, also having been beaten and tortured and jailed. Nariman watched her brother die right in front of her from a round of live ammunition. Her brother had not been there to join the protest. Her brother came to visit his sister. And he heard a commotion outside and he stepped out to try to help and was shot in the back in front of her. But despite all of this horror, the Tamimi house that we visited was full of joy and laughter. The children were just children playing video games and complaining about having to help set up for dinner. People from the village came in and out, always greeted with hugs and kisses and greeting us, strangers and interlopers, with hospitality and open arms and hugs. Thank you. Um, let me, uh, I'm going to leave out a story about Matty Pellet. Um, who was a, a general who, who then turned to become a peacemaker. You can look him up for yourself. Um, and, but I'd like to say that at the recent UU General Assembly last month, uh, there was an AIW, an action of immediate witness, that was overwhelmingly adopted entitled Solidarity with Palestinians. Uh, some may want to say solidarity with both Palestinians and Israelis, just like many of us when we first heard the slogan, Black Lives Matter, wanted to say all lives matter. I suggest that you read the full text of that AIW for yourself and, and, um, and learn more about it as it calls for witnessing, educating, organizing, and advocating for Palestinian rights and freedom. Let's aim for a world where we all, all of us, including Palestinians, are free. And um, let's work to create that beloved community and make it as inclusive and just, and just as possible as we support the peacemakers. Thank you. <laughs>